Hi and welcome. We're going to look at the math of reflection and refraction. You watch a lot of conceptual videos on these two ideas and now we're going to dive into the math which varies from very simple to slightly complex. Uh, starting with reflection, reflection is extremely simple. If I have a surface and I have an incoming light ray that hits at an angle, it will reflect back out at an angle. So we have this thing known as the law of reflection. With respect to a line that is perpendicular to the surface, called a normal line, the angle of the incident ray and the angle of the reflected ray are related in a very simple way. They're equal. This, from my understanding, is a consequence of conservation of momentum in two dimensions. But it's really that simple. And this will become important in certain geometric problems you do, but it'll also be important when we try to understand how curved mirrors work later down the road. Now let's move on. Oh, by the way, I think it's important to mention that this actually, this equality has the name of the law of reflection. If anybody ever asks you what the law of reflection is, is that the incident angle and the reflected angle are equal to each other. All right, moving on. Now the conceptual videos explain in great detail how refraction works. There is a notion that when a wave changes from a medium that is faster to a medium that is slower, or from slower to faster, and the wave is incident upon that boundary at an angle, there will be a change in the angle. That's refraction. So for instance, if I have a light ray that is approaching from air on one side into water on the other side, the light will be bent toward the normal line as it enters the water. We would call this angle one and this angle two. And you notice both angles are with respect to the normal line, the perpendicular line at the surface. How much it's bent depends on several factors and it also follows a mathematical model. So the first thing we have to understand and talk about is this idea known as the index of refraction. The index of refraction, we use the symbol n. And what it is, is a the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum, 3 times 10 to the 8, to the speed of the light in the medium that we are traveling through. Every medium that is transparent that allows light to pass through it slows light down. Now, again, we went way into that on the conceptual video. This is the mathematical relationship. For instance, the index of refraction of air is about 1. And the reason for that is that air barely slows it down. So if you were to take those values, the value of the speed of light in air is pretty close to the speed of light in a vacuum. So we get the index of refraction of 1. Mind you, it isn't exactly one. It slows it down just the tiniest amount, but for practical purposes, that is what it is. Now, for water, the index of refraction is about 1.33, and that means that the speed of light in a vacuum, when divided by the speed of light in water, which is a smaller number, gives you 1.33. So it's slowing it down. I'm going to call the index of refraction of air, N1, and the index of refraction, N2. So N1 is on the air side, N2 is on the water side. The relationship between the index of refraction and the amount that the light ray is bent is governed by something known as Snell's Law. Snell's Law says that the relationship between these quantities is that N1 times the sine of angle 1 equals n2 times the sine of angle 2. And if you know three of those quantities, say for instance n1, angle 1, and n2, you can find the fourth quantity, angle 2. If that were the case, I just want to show you the algebra really quickly because I know that um, it could, people get stuck a little bit sometimes when they have to solve for an angle that's contained within a trig function. So if I were to do this and bring this up over here, I'm first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide both sides by n2 and I'm going to get n1 over n2 
times the sine of angle 1 equals the sine of angle 2. So if I want to solve for an angle that's contained within a trig function, I need to use the inverse trig function. So when that is all done, angle 2 is going to be equal to the inverse sine of n1 over n2 times the sine of angle 1. So if you have to do that algebra, there you go. Solving for either of the indexes of refraction is much, much easier. The next topic I want to discuss is an idea called total internal reflection. When a light ray moves from a slow medium back into a fast medium, the light ray would be bent away from the normal. So if this is angle 1 and this is angle 2, we're going to see angle 2 is bigger than angle 1. It's just the reverse of going from fast to slow. As I make angle 1 bigger, angle 2 is also going to get bigger. At some point, angle 2 is going to reach 90 degrees and something really interesting happens. At that point, the light will reflect back off the boundary as if it were a mirror surface. This idea is called total internal reflection. And it's actually a more perfect reflection than the reflection you get from a mirror. None of the energy or light is absorbed. It's, it's absolutely a perfect, it's a perfect mirror. The angle where this first happens has a special name. It's called the critical angle. And because we're refracting to 90 degrees and getting this total internal reflection now, it'd be nice to know what that angle is. Now, you have to understand that any angle bigger than the critical angle, you'll still get total internal reflection. The critical angle is just the first angle where this occurs. Now, if I use Snell's law, and I'm going to call this N1 and N2, and we do have to recognize that if we're going from slow to fast, that N1 is greater than N2. So again, using Snell's law, N1 times the sine of this critical angle equals N2 times the sine of 90 degrees. That's the definition of the critical angle when the refracted angle is 90 degrees. Now the sine of 90 degrees is 1, so it just disappears. That means that the sine of the critical angle is N2 over N1. And if we want to solve for the critical angle, it is going to be the inverse sine of N2 over N1. And if you ever get confused and you don't know which one is N2 and N1, just know that your calculator will give you an error if you get it backwards. Um, you cannot have an inverse sine of a number bigger than 1. So N2 has to be smaller than N1 for this to work. There will be problems involving this. It's a very straightforward concept. It's just a special case of refraction. At this point, you are armed with all the information you need to take on your worksheet. Good luck with that.